I was going to pray over myself again, but Sam prayed all the stuff over me that I was going to pray over myself. <laughs> so that's definitely the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Well, the last um, however many days we are into before Pentecost has been absolutely amazing. And I don't know about you, but I don't think as I was imagining the apostles tearing in the upper room, what that would look like exactly. And I suppose we won't know until we get in heaven, but it's fun. It's been fun just experimenting with what that might look like. So it's been, it's been totally awesome. <clears throat> so I guess I'm going to pray anyways, Lord, just Holy Spirit, flow through me, Lord Jesus. I just want to be your vessel. I just, um, anything from me, throw it to the ground, Lord. And there's so much on this topic, Lord. Would you just please highlight the things that are important that you want for us to know? Would you touch everyone's heart here that is listening now or will listen later um, to receive? Um, Lord, we just thank you that you, your, your Holy Spirit is what gives understanding um, to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... Um, it's interesting with the, um, you know, I'm always mulling around about different topics to, um, to cover. And um, one of the um, things that, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's very often born out of something that's going on in my own heart or something that I'm wondering about or searching through and so on. And, um, and then it's like, okay, this, this would probably be a good thing to to teach on and so that's that's a beautiful thing because what's happening is that the person that gets the most out of this process is me <laughs> so I'm I'm really grateful about that so it's interesting because um, I, I, ha I ran across this article and then I and then I lost it and I couldn't find it again but it was a it was a university instructor at a Christian university and he put a challenge on, on his students to read through the whole New Testament and he, what he wanted them to do was to find the themes of the Bible, you know, subjects, topics that were being covered there so you could kind of get a little bit of an idea about what was being talked a lot about because of, very often people will say, you know, what's the biggest topic in the Bible and they'll say, it's love, you know, or and if from for me, from a financial background, I always thought it was interesting that there was more in the Bible about money than there was about love, you know, because God is concerned about love is expressed through the money, right? You know, what you do with it. But so anyway, so we had them go through the whole New Testament. And um, I really apologize. I don't have that resource because I tried finding again, and it's just one of those things I stumbled on. And um, what he found was that um, that as they um, organized all these topics at the topic that was talked about the most throughout the New Testament. Interestingly enough, I was, wasn't what I expected, but it was the subject of false teachers, false teaching, and falling away. Isn't that interesting? And, and so here you, you figure on, on the, um, the church and the disciples after Jesus ascended, they were anticipating his return, right? They thought he was going to be coming back even in their lifetime. And all these topics that they're teaching about and discipling people into, but one of the biggest topics was watch out for false teachers. Watch out for, um, don't fall away. Don't fall away from the truth. Um, you know, that there would be savage wolves that would come in and to seek to, um, you know, lead the flock astray. Even the elect may fall away, right? I mean, some of this is coming to your mind. And so I was you know, pulled out, you know, what's, what's kind of fun, and you should do this, is you just go to a Bible app, or you just Google it and just say, you know, uh, you know, how many occurrences of false teacher or false teaching or false prophet or falling away, things like that. It's worded differently, but it's all the same thing, correct? It's all over. I mean, there's just pages and pages and pages of scripture, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to cut some of this out. So I'm giving you that assignment because we'd be here you know, just reading the whole New Testament, and we don't have time to do it in the next hour, right? So just a good thing. But there, um, but just to kind of condense it and just recap on what I just shared, there's just basically two main things that Jesus talked about when, when he returned. As it, as it pertained to his return, he talked about do not be deceived. Um, 
he talked about the promise of many false prophets that were going to come and that they would lead people astray. And so you might say, well, why doesn't he talk about all the things that you should be doing? Well, the assumption is that if he's saying do not fall away or do not be deceived, he's saying there's a whole teaching here, this whole, this whole truth that I'm leaving you about sanctifying yourself, about getting holy, about getting ready for my return, coming back, getting ready to be a pure and spotless bride. He's all that teach, all the rest of that stuff that's in the New Testament. He's saying in between all that, don't fall away from that stuff. Don't be deceived away from these true teachings that I've given you. It's intertwined between all of that stuff because you can plant all this good seed, but you got to protect against all that good seed being twisted or being uprooted. Does this make sense? So it's, it's, a, it's a consistent theme. So what we want to do as responsible, faithful people of the Lord is that we want to ask ourselves, um, what, does it what does the Bible say that a body is supposed to look like? And we want to be in an environment that is, is focusing in on faithfulness to the word. And we want to know where there could be veering and getting off track. Because the thing about a cult is that they don't... They don't know they're a cult if they are one. So I'm introducing the concept of a cult. And my daughter was like, what are you going to teach on? Like, I'm going to teach about cults. And she's like, well, I don't understand what you're going to teach on. <laughs> because, you know, maybe that terminology is not as, you know, until you get kind of introduced to that terminology, you're not really familiar with it. But essentially, you know, I'm going to kind of give you a simplistic view of it. But, and then I'm going to go into more detail and break it down. But all a cult really is, is a cult is, is um, a group that is teaching a false teaching or a leader that's teaching a false teaching and all the things that that false teaching manifests, which the Bible talks about, and we're going to break down. So a cult is, you know, the, the, the uh, following of false teaching. Does that make sense? But there are some th other things that I want to, that I'm going to break down related to that. But just before I do... You know, I just want to let you know that also this this was kind of birthed out of, as I said, things that we're going through. We were having a leadership meeting a few uh, weeks ago, and obviously what we're doing as a church is we are a church that's focused in on Jesus' return um, and in a very active, tangible way of believing that the, the, the prophecies in the Bible are being fulfilled. And even the apostles were focusing in on living their life as though he was coming back any minute. And what type of people ought we to be in the same manner. And so oftentimes what's happening is we're, is we're working to be as close and ready and, and uh, spotless as a bride as we can for Jesus' return. Some of the things that we're doing um, that we're forerunning are offensive to people or they're different and in the Western church. And in that regard, very often from the, in, in the Western church, you know, ma many people will say that it's not really the way that the church has really been. I, I, I mean, our idea of Western church, which is, you know, 60 minutes, once a week, come in, you know, sing one or two songs, um, you know, read a couple scripture, listen to a 20 minute message, um, you know, pass the plate and then we're all out of here because we got a game to watch or something like that. Or we're going, you, you, this is not really true Christianity the way that it was um, set up to be. And I think we have to really recognize the fast, fact that zealousness for the Lord is offensive. And so we want to be careful as we're, as we're looking at forerunning some things that are, they're, they're different, however, completely biblical but because we don't want there to be any misunderstanding about it, even for ourselves. We want to keep ourselves in check as to what the Bible says. We want to be clear about what is it? I mean, what is false teaching? What is a cult? What is not a cult? And so we're going to um, we're gonna break that down. And by the way, a good example that you can look at would be um, uh, International House of Prayer, uh, Mike Bickle. I mean, if you were to Google that, I mean, there was in the early years of of IHOP, which now is like almost, you know, in, in mainline church denominations. And I mean... It's a lot more understood and well known. But even if you were to search something on Mike Bickle, you know, Mike Bickle occult or something like that, you know, there's 
there, you, you're going to get maybe the pages that are like, it's a cult. And then, we, and then when Mike Biggle did a response to that, it was like, there's a, there's a misunderstanding about this. So we're going to teach into this. And what he taught into what cults are, the seven characteristics of a cult, which we're going to talk about, is considered mainline church teaching. As I was looking this up, uh, other resources about the subject of cults, what they were doing is referring to Mike Biggle's teaching. <laughs> Rather than giving their own teaching, like, well, here's the teaching. We don't need to duplicate it because Mike Biggle's already done a phenomenal job at teaching about what cults are, a thorough job on that. But but isn't it interesting, though, that Mike Bickle and the House of Prayer, which now we think, okay, this idea is amazing, but at one time they were considered a cult because of their zealousness for the Lord and for that wholeheartedness, and just because it was different, right? Different. I mean, sometimes, um, you know, just in, in maybe um, kind of in a slang sense, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard it said where you become wholehearted for the Lord and maybe you stop hanging out with your friends and you're not drinking with them or hanging out with them anymore crowds and they're like, oh yeah, they joined a cult. They're at church every week now. You know, it's kind of like in a negative sense, it's like, yeah, they're wholehearted. We're not, we don't like that. It makes us look bad. So we're going to call them a cult. Although that is not necessarily anything of the sort, but so we just want to discern the body. That's why we're going to do this. We want to understand, is it safe? Is it true? Is it biblical? Those are important questions to ask. So the definition of a cult, just kind of in a summary, is false teachings coming out of a group or a leader. So it's, um, you know, typically exclusive. They might say we're the only ones that have that truth. Everyone else is wrong. And if you leave our group, your salvation is in danger. And we're going to ostracize you. And we're going to make you feel guilt. And we're going to make you feel fearful. And just all of this manipulation and baggage. And it's often it's secretive. Certain teachings are not available to outsiders. Or they're presented only to certain members. Sometimes after even taking vows of confidentiality. I mean, there's several things that are done by certain, um, well, that we would consider, you know, more, more common. Christ, uh, Christianity would commonly refer to certain things as, as cults that they have, um, secret things that they do that they don't have open to the rest of the public. Mormons come to my mind, Church of the Latter-day Saints, some of the secret procedures and things that they do. Authority, authoritarian, a human leader expects total loyalty and unquestioned obedience would be another one. Okay, nobody has any freedom. Everybody's fearful. I got to get permission to to go to the bathroom, to think about anything. I mean, it's just a completely controlled, and I'm going to kind of go into some of these things. But um it just is a kind of a broad overview. And I, I'm hoping that maybe there might be another time because kind of related to this subject, but not completely the same is the apostate church. And it's, it's the church that starts to fall away from the truth that it once had. And in some ways, that's what happens with cults. They start off with a certain amount of truth and they fall away from that. But I'm going to have to hit that on another time because that's too big of a topic. So as I said, what Mike Bickle teaches on the subject is main stream church teaching, and it's widely accepted. So I want to begin by um, just sharing a couple of scriptures with you about this subject. Um, God's, uh, the truth of God's word is what exposes the false. John 8.32 says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So obviously exposure is important. So a cult is a group that derives um, from the doctrines and practices of historic, I'm sorry, they deviate from the doctrines and practice of historic Christianity, and they have inordinate loyalty to that leader whose beliefs are not found in Scripture. Another example I think would be a good one would be like Joseph Smith of the Latter-day Saints, um, who's believed to be their prophet that under divine inspiration wrote the Book of Mormon from some gold plates. And um, his... Uh, he is given precedence over the Bible. Now, they wouldn't say that because they would say uh, he's given precedence because our Bible is a misinterpretation, which is very often a, a, an indicator of many cults where they will say that the Bible isn't true and that it's a mistranslation. It's That's the oldest trick out of the enemy's book is to attack the word of God and say it's not really true. It's a mistranslation. It's been watered down, etc. So... Paul warned of false teachers in the mighty church of Ephesus. In Acts 20, 30, he said, Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. In 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, I should be telling you some of these. I might go a little bit fast here, but that was Acts 20, 30. And the next one is 
1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, in case you want to follow along. And then after that, I'm going to jump to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. By the way, one of the reasons why we're also going through this, too, is that we just want to expose deception, and we want to help other people to avoid it. So 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. As I urge you, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach to no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables or endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some have strayed, having turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understand, understanding neither what they say nor things that they affirm. So he, Paul is warning Timothy, you need to be ready for this and be on guard for this because this is, um, this is something you're going to face everywhere you go. He goes on, Paul's continuing to tell Timothy in chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words which come from envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself. I mean, it's interesting as I read this, I mean, this just sounds to me like the Pharisees. I mean, we're, we're going to spend all day arguing back and forth over these little subtleties of the law, but, but they've forgotten the heart of God. They've completely disconnected from the vine. And Paul is warning, warning Timothy to be on guard about this. Jesus and Paul both prophesied of false teachers in the end times. We're familiar with Matthew chapter 24, 4 through 5. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So that's Matthew 24, 4 through 5. I want to mention something on this. I mean, what does that look like? So Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just reveal this, because this is going to be a big thing right here. Okay, um, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Of course, you know, um, people are going to use the name of Christ. I mean, sometimes people, uh, we might think that, well, if somebody's a false teacher, they're not going to bring up Jesus Christ's name. They're not going to bring up honor of him. They're not going to, they're not going to uh, give him any, um, you know, acceptance whatsoever. This is not true. This is definitely not true. And it's one of the biggest deceptions. Even the demons believe in the name of Jesus, right? So we can't just think because somebody, you know, calls on the name of the Lord, or they mention Jesus Christ, or they're talking about Christ. I mean, there's all kinds of deceptions out there. That's not the measure of whether um, something is truth or something is not truth. And in fact, I think even just this idea of, you know, I am the Christ. I mean, what is behind that? I mean, it's, it is self-elevation, it is, it is kind of, it's, it's somebody that's saying, I want to, I want to build a following. I'm building my influence. I'm building my kingdom. And it's a subtle thing because I, I think we all know of examples of people in the faith that started off and they were faithful and they were humble, but that whole saying absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I mean, there's some truth to that. Right. And the reason why is because we've got the sin nature in us. There's a way that seems right to us, but in the end, it leads to death. That's why anytime we or any teacher, no matter how gifted they are, if they disconnect from the vine, they cannot bear good fruit. And we have to constantly be in evaluation of that fruit. And so I, I just want to point out that's what is behind that. Ask Holy Spirit reveal that. What is behind that? I am the Christ and they will deceive many. What are the motives of the, of the individuals that are delivering a certain message? They might be using the name of Jesus Christ, but what are the underlining motives? Matthew 24, 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So as, as the end time revival increases, as the intensity on the earth increases, so is deception going to increase. When we look at history with Israel, as the impending, as the enemies were rising up around Israel, 
as the intensity of, you know, concern about their, their safety, peace and safety increased. So did the deception of the prophets, the number of prophets that were like, peace and safety, peace and safety, it's going to be all right. You don't need to do anything, King Hezekiah. It's all going to be good. You know, and then you've got prophets that are that are preaching repentance and, and judgment like Jeremiah. And then this is the one that they're persecuting. This is the pattern of the Bible, right? So at, jumping down a little bit further, Acts 20, verses 29 through 31. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, also from among yourselves. Note, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. So this is one of the main reasons why the common characteristic, uh, characteristic of a cult is to suppress the truth or to redefine the truth or to take the truth out of context which is the reason why we have to really read our word, know our word. We have to talk to the Holy Spirit about the revelation of the word because just about any scripture in the Bible can be twisted in different ways. We have to look at the whole counsel of scripture. We have to really study the Holy Word and we need the Holy Spirit. We must have the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Bible even says that, you know, a, a non-believer cannot comprehend the things of the Spirit. It's spiritually discerned. It's a part of the equation. So, some of the um, so some of the warning signs when we look at um, their, their deviations from the essentials beliefs of the Christian faith. So false teachers do not hold to the main and plain doctrines of the scriptures. They start by drifting away, and then the doctrines eventually move to a point where they're even denying the truth. Especially if those doctrines and those truths in the word are indicting them. I mean, this is the you want to talk about some ticked off Pharisees. I mean, Jesus Christ was just constantly putting the word. He was taking the law that they, that they were puffed up about and putting it back on them and saying, and, and their law that they were putting their salvation on is what indicted them. And so the word exposes, the truth exposes the darkness. We must, um, so we, we want to accept other things that are main and plain doctrine of the church, like Jesus is God's only son. He's fully God. He's fully man. He was born of a virgin without sin. Um, Jesus's death, the bodily re resurrection and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Trinity, one God existing in three persons, salvation by faith alone, by grace alone, and by, Christ, by Christ alone, the infallibility of scripture. It's the final authority on all matters. I mean, some people would debate this one, but I would say the literal interpretation of Genesis, literally, you don't just say, well, this Genesis is kind of going to fit into, um, you know, the idea of the earth being millions and millions of years old. I mean, um, or the um, evolution, you know, I'm that. No, that's not that's not what the Bible says um, And the unity and the diversity of the body. So this is. We, we've got to stand firm on those historical teachings of the Orthodox Christian Church. And this is where cults vary away from those different things. They vary away from things like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the Westminster Confession. Or maybe they say they believe them, but they vary away from them. So those are important too. So the battle for truth today focuses on defining who Jesus is and how we are to love him. That's really the expression of all this. We've got to love God as expressed through allegiance to Jesus in the Bible. So it's basically like, you know, where we put our, our we put our money where our mouth is kind of thing, you know, where, where the Bible, where the, you know, where what you say has to be matched by your actions. So the truth about Jesus in the Bible often offends humanists. And it even offends those people within the truth. It's like I would have mentioned to you a little bit earlier that, um, Zeal was offensive. Jesus' zeal, when he said, when he went into the temple, you know, you've made my temple into a, a marketplace, a den of robbers, and he was ticked, right? I mean, it is zeal for the Lord is offensive to people because it, it judges them. So the truth, um, and some other things too, the ideas about God's mercy are often emphasized in the church, whereas his just nature are de-emphasized or redefined. 
So that's a little bit, God's judgment in that side of him, the whole sword coming out of the mouth thing, you know, judging the whole earth, his wrath, uh, it's not very positive. So we're going to de-emphasize that, but we're going to really emphasize his mercy and his love when really what that, what that is doing is that's redefining who Jesus is. And that's, um, yeah, that, that's like her heresy. So his right is God to establish absolute standards of life and morality to which the nations will be held accountable for. So in other words, Jesus is the only way of salvation. So I'm going to jump in to some of these seven characteristics of cults. If you want to dig into this deeper, I, I drew off of Mike Bickle's training on this, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, and then just kind of, you know, put some of my own um, thoughts in here and from some other sources. But it's a really good resource if you you know, you can, you can definitely grab a hold of that. But one of the first things that is the seven characteristics of a cult is that the loss of critical thinking. You know, there's multitudes of studies out there that show how technology, and even like particularly gaming, by the way, especially in certain ages of our youth, that it actually, it shows how it damages the brain. I mean, I probably don't need to tell you that there's been study after study after study that's talking about the dumbing down of America. The whole idea of the way that our media presents information, it used to be that they would present the facts and you critically thought and sorted them out, but not anymore. Now, I mean, they make it e easy for you. So they take the news and they've interpreted it for you and said, here's what it means. Is that good or bad? That's very bad. There's a loss of critical thinking. I was, uh, my friend Alice turned me on to this great book, Switch on Your Brain by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And it's all based upon the scripture of the Bible and about our mind and the brain and the connection between all, all the science and how that all matches and lines up. We don't, we don't think. I mean, it's funny, the book was even talking about how multitasking has really actually made us dumber. We think it's smart, but it's really dumb. Um, and that, you know, brain, our, our brains are, uh, you know, atrophying, or that's probably not a right word, but you know what I mean. I mean, we, there's a loss of critical thinking, and this is a big issue with cults. There's a loss of critical thinking because the leader of the cult or the group says, I've got all the revelation. You're not smart enough. Have any revelation. You need me. You're not smart enough to understand that word, especially, you know, if you're challenged by anything in the word. Well, I read the word and it said this. You don't understand. You're not smart enough to interpret it. I want to just tell you that this is a sinister scheme of the enemy, and this is not just something that exists in cults. This exists all over Christendom, and it's a lie from the enemy telling us that we cannot understand. And so what happens, it's like, ah, why even try? <clears throat> Why even try? Or, or it's somebody there that is, t somebody that I'm listening to has many more degrees than I do, and they have a smarter IQ than I do, so surely they are much smarter and they understand better than I do. No, the Holy Spirit um, doesn't work that way. You know, fortunately, God works off of our desire, and he gives the revelation, and he doesn't Based, doesn't do it based upon IQ scores. He created all of us just the way that he means for us to be. You know, he makes our brain work the way our brain is supposed to work. That's why it's not, we're not all alike. We're not all cookie cutter in that sense. And so I think one of the smartest things that we can do, whether we're talking about <clears throat> cult or not, is just to break off any kind of thinking that <clears throat> you cannot learn or you cannot understand or that it's just too overwhelming to you. We give up too easy. We need to stay in it. We need to stay in that word and continue to search it out. And oftentimes there's things that I read that I didn't understand. And I didn't understand until years later and the Holy Spirit made it click because I connected something I read in another book and then something else. And then all of a sudden it all just kind of came through. But we got to stay in it and, and we don't want to be vulnerable in that way, whether, whether it's a cultish type of thing or whether it's just apathetic behavior. It's passivity and and God does not look favorably on that. He, I, I mean, it's sinful. It's sinful to just say, well, I'm good and, and God's happy with me like I am. It's, it's taking your talent and it's burying it in the ground and saying, well, <clears throat> I knew he's a hard master. And no, it's not true. So, yeah, I just want to touch on that a little bit. Critical thinking is important. So cult members in a cult, the members must accept the cult leader's teaching without challenging anything at all. Members are discouraged from searching out the scriptures themselves. 
And this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we must all test each teaching that we hear in the light of Scripture. We do not want to receive a teaching that you cannot see with your own eyes in the Bible. You know, there's a, there's some, um, my friend um, Alice does a lot of conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses that come visit her. God bless her. She's so faithful. And she's like, they all, they always like to steer her away from the Bible. She takes them to the Bible. They steer away from the Bible and to their pamphlets, <laughs> to their other literature, right? I mean, it's good when the only literature, the main literature in your church is the Bible, right? And they're like, that's the piece of literature that we have. So <clears throat> often what happens is um, when, when we're looking at the Bible, we're not, we're not supposed to just um, quickly accept ideas without examining them. Um, you know, I, I love the fact that Tom will often say, you know, look at this passage. It's good for you to see it in your own Bible. That's really true. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul reacted to the early Christians who were saying, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Apollos, I follow Jesus Christ. And Paul's like saying, is Jesus Christ divided? Like, he's not divided. I mean, these, these leaders can help facilitate, a, you know, a direction, but ultimately it's Jesus Christ who we're following. So... One of the things, too, that I think would be the way the Bible would say it or the way that, you know, a, a true church would say it is, is not, it, I don't think that it's, um, there's nothing wrong with um, it, uh, referencing someone. Like, I'm sure what happened in the earlier church is they would say, hey, you know, the letter of Paul or Paul said this or Timothy said this or Barnabas said this, of course, because God established them as shepherds over the flock. And that's good. But they didn't have the written Bible like we have now. And so there's nothing wrong with referring to somebody and say, well, Paula taught on that and X, Y, Z. But what would be really better would be you searching it out in your own word and saying, this is what the Bible says. And what this does is it removes this accusation that somebody else might come along and say, like, um, wait, are you a, like a, you know, a cult follower of Paula because Paula said this, Paula said that, you know, or, or whatever. Do you follow me? You have, it, it's much better when it's coming out of the Bible yourself. That's, that's, a, I think that's pleasing to the Lord because we're supposed to test all things. We're supposed to hold fast to what is good, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. And then we want to be like, Sam was talking about um, Berean when she was praying. Um, Paul really uh, commended the Bereans. He called them noble because in Acts 17, 11, the Bereans received the word with all readiness. So they received it and they're like, oh yeah, this resonates with my spirit. I feel like, yes, this makes sense. I like what you're saying, but they didn't stop there. Then they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. This is what we're supposed to do. Sometimes it might seem overwhelming. I mean, I, it, it's supposed to be an easy yoke, right? Even sometimes a Bible verse at, the, at a time, listening to, um, you know, an, maybe um, you're driving, you listen to the audio Bible or you're, you, you're like the Lord impresses something on your mind. I mean, I, I know I was doing, I was reading a certain part of the Bible and, and it was like, God said, no, I want you to read Joel today. I'm like, okay, I'm going to read Joel. You know, you, you're engaged in that relationship. And even if it's little by little, maybe you're writing down a favorite scripture on a card, but you're, you're chewing on that information. You're, you're saying, Lord, I'm going to live with you forever. And we're going to get married. And I want to be in this relationship with you. And that's part of this process. So this is how you become convinced of things. You search it out daily. I think I just said that. Holy Spirit revelation. We're also exhorted to test the spirits, to discern the spirit behind the teaching. This is something I was mentioning a little bit about earlier, right? With Matthew 24, 4 through 5, you know, many will come. I am the Christ. What is the spirit behind the teaching? As you look um, at, for example, the light hop statement of our faith and our church doctrine, what is the purpose of what we're teaching? It's good to understand. Good to look at that and know. By the way, do you know, most people don't know. So, so, sometimes there's like a, somebody will come against you and say, well, I don't know if I like what you da, 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 teach about such and such. And you might say, well, what is, what is, what is your doctrine? What, are you, what is the statement of faith of what you believe? I mean, could you go ahead and give me the points point by point? They don't even know. <laughs> Most people don't even know. Um, it's just a, a reminder that we all need to know what we believe. John 4, 1, beloved, do not, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I'm sorry, I think I reread that. Another measure of what is the motivation behind that is, is the teaching focused in on fear or is it focused in on faith? 
Is the teaching just focused in on looking for external manifestations of the spirit like signs and wonders? Or is it focused on, on consecration, holiness, growing in closeness to God, growing in hearing his voice, the simple things, not necessarily the, now I'm not trying to say those other things are wrong, but, but what, what are we looking for? Are we looking for, um, yeah, the, the, the more, um, the more external visual things, or are we, are we really looking at this uh, revolution that happened in our own heart that changes us? Because one of the biggest things I, I think about is the miracle of what does our life look like? I mean, this is the biggest um, neon sign to everyone around us that something is transforming our heart and that we're, we are, um, um, that's our testimony is what's happening in our own life. So one of the other things is related to, um, like the second thing related to cults is, cults dishonor the family unit instead of insisting on biblical priority of the family unit. So in cults, um, I mean, some, not all, but, you know, children are taught to be more loyal to the leader than to the parents. <laughs> you know, I had an experience, we had an experience with, with um, another church that we went to one time where, where the leader, um, fortunately I have a really close relationship with my daughter and, and, she, and, and we have mutual trust, but the, the leader tried to suggest to her that I, I was wrong in a decision that I was making as a parent. And, um, I, and I was, that, that is not of Christ. We honor the family. That is really bad fruit. And, and it's very difficult for, to, for, for families in an environment like that to have trust and faith if they think that the leaders are going to undermine the, 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 the staff family, which was established by God. So they'll even go as far as more loyalty to cult leaders than to husbands. You know, members are often required to cut ties with, Sam, with families. Now, I want to distinguish something here for a minute because if you've cut ties with your family, uh, or if there's a there's a break in the relationship between your family. It doesn't mean you're in a cult. <laughs> it might just mean that um, it could mean that for maybe they broke ties with you. I mean, maybe maybe they don't want to have anything to do with you, and so they've distanced themselves for you for some reason. Um, maybe you. Um, acted wrongly towards them. I mean, this is often what happens sometimes when somebody becomes a new believer. They are so excited about Christ that they go throw up on everybody that they know. And everybody is turned, we call it diary of the mouth. And everybody is just like, I don't want nothing to do with you. I mean, they just turned everybody off. Does that make sense? Now, it's not, um, it was innocent. I mean, we've all done this, right? You know, good intentions. And we're like, Ugh. But often it is, it's out of wrong motives. I mean, it's maybe it's out of fear. We're like, I want you to get it. Because if you don't get it, then I don't know what's going to happen to you, right? This is not God. He doesn't operate that way. We're not the one who brings somebody. The Holy Spirit is what woos people into the kingdom. We're, we're supposed to love them. We can talk about the truth, but we don't do it with such intensity. Like, I just don't know. If, I'm afraid of what's going to happen to you. <laughs> this is going to break family relationships. I mean, maybe not always, but it's not the right recipe to get, you, you know, to cultivate uh, openness and dialogue, if that makes sense. So be aware of the fact, we've all made mistakes. I mean, this is not a condemnation. Be, and God can heal anything. But I think we need to distinguish between what sometimes might be our own good intended actions, but we might have maybe contributed to some separation there but the but the model of the bible in the church should be as much as it depends on us we want to live at peace with our brothers and sisters we want to encourage the relationships between restoration and healing in family relationships not separation the, the thing is is that you know and i know some people will point to the scripture that in john um that I think 17 that you know that that the Jesus came to um, came with a sword and that it's going to be mother against father and children against you know these families divided the thing is is that Jesus is the one that divides though not leaders does that make sense he's the one who does the separation it's not going to be like me saying look don't have anything to do with them because they don't get what I'm saying so you know until they figure it out I wouldn't associate with them that's terrible. <laughs> That's awful. That is not the Bible. That, that, that is a behavior of, of a cult. So, and again, what the Bible talks about is, is it encourages us in scripture to, 
have reconciliation, mend broken family relationships with love. You know, if you're in one of these situations where you just, you put the foot in the mouth, I know I've done it so many times, the best thing to do, and it's a beautiful testimony, is just to repent. Just go to that person and just say, you know what, I really need to apologize because I was super intense and I'm still so grateful for what God's doing in my heart, but really handle that wrong. And I just want to ask, would you forgive me? That is good fruit. That's fruit that can heal. That's God working things together for the good of those who called are called according to his purpose. So just, you know, everything, God can make all things new. So it's important for us to remember that. We know Mark talks about honoring your parents with integrity. Ephesians 6, obey your parents. We all love that one, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a commitment to love and communicate with one's family. And, um, but... Let me, let me clarify. That's not the same as needing their approval. It's not the same as needing their approval. Um, you know, there's, there comes a point where somebody is, and um, you know, maybe a youth, and they're turning into a young adult, and they're establishing their own faith. They need to respect and obey their parents, but they also, um, they don't, they may be growing in the Lord and deepening their relationship, and maybe their parents don't completely, are not in that same direction. Um, what they need to be able to do is, is just continue to, go into that um, secret place with the Lord and grow. And it's, um, they don't, I mean, though I think the Bible would say, you know, seek me first the kingdom of God and let all these other things be added unto them. So um, it's not about needing approval. I think that's what the Bible would say. That's not what a person needs to say or the leader says, but the Bible says, seek me first. You don't have to have the approval of other people to do that. So we want to continue to reach out to our family, love them, communicate with them, even if they don't agree with us. Third characteristic of a cult, they isolate members and reject them for leaving instead of helping them to do God's will. So what they'll do is, as I've kind of alluded to, they'll, um, the cults will isolate people from their families, the church, and society. They reject anyone who leaves and warn them, saying that they're going to be judged by God or they're going to lose God's blessing, um, things like that. They're taught to make a lifetime commitment to that group. And um, some groups even teach that you have to get permission to even leave that group. So this is obviously all of these are expressions that are not biblical whatsoever. What the Bible teaches is that God owns people, not a cult, not a church, not a group. God owns people. People are accountable to God. Um, the, the leaders in, a, uh, in the Bible, the leader's concern is to help people succeed in growing and doing God's will in their life and supporting them in whatever direction that they go. I mean, people change paths. Sometimes God does um, move us around. It doesn't necessarily always mean that something is, is wrong. He has a perfect plan. He's working all things together for the good. Um, you know, I just want to say this, this is really not just a cult thing, but I would say this is a church thing in general. I mean, it can be a cult thing if it's handled wrong, like I just described. That was the wrong way of handling it. But I think it's important to realize that in churches all over, there is a struggle. Um, when pe people leave, they come and go. I mean, I, I think about but first of all, I've gone to many different churches in the course of being in the military because I moved, and so circumstances would cause me to move. But the other thing, too, is just that for many of us as believers, we're in this process of growing in, in, in the Lord. And I remember when I was in my 20s, I didn't, know, I didn't know anything about denominations. I didn't understand anything about theology. I didn't understand anything about eschatology. I, didn't know, I was just like, I believe the Lord. I got the Bible. You know, I'm a, I was a baby. I'm, I'm growing in the Lord. And I think it's understandable to know that sometimes people in that path, they might, they might make moves um, from place to place as they're beginning to refine what they believe and they're finding, uh, looking to align themselves with a group or a church or a denomination that is in alignment with what the Lord is showing them as they're searching out the word of God. So I don't, I don't think that's, I just think that's kind of normal, don't you? So uh, in fact, just the other day, um, you know, my husband and I had a meeting with a uh, with um, a pastor that we love and we've had a relationship with for a long period of time and, and still do ministry things with sometimes. And, and we were talking about how he was saying that that is a struggle, that that's kind of a struggle because circumstances vary. You know, it's tough on the members, it's tough on the pastors, but relationships are hard. And he said that, you know, one of the biggest challenges is, is, is just like maybe 
just the circumstances, maybe not t talking it out or understanding why. Um, it, it's, it's just a difficult thing sometimes. And so we want to be really careful about this because um, I, I remember another book that I read, it talked about one of the biggest challenges to the Christian walk is other Christians. <laughs> it's the laundry cycle that we've been talking about, right? It's we're, we're like rubbing up against each other. We're like, oh, you know, I just want to get out of this load. I mean, it's too heavy, right? <laughs> so, um, but, but I, I appreciated his transparency. He was just talking about that this is tough sometimes and it's, it's a difficult thing and we want to handle it rightly. And, and um, he was just talking about his heart and just wanting to be able to handle that rightly because it's it's hard thing sometimes. So some of us may have had this awkward experience and where maybe you've left a church um, who you had a fellowship with and you've had them disconnect with you. And maybe, maybe it isn't because you disconnected with them because... I don't think that's biblical. We know that's not biblical, but maybe they disconnected with you and that was hurtful and that was painful. That's, that's really not what the Bible teaches. I mean, for, for, a, for a church to say you shouldn't associate with those people because they've, they're missing something or they're not loyal to us or they don't get it, um, that, that's wrong. That's, that's not biblical whatsoever. And so, um, as I said earlier, it's not exclusively a cult thing, but this just happens in churches all across America. And we have to commit at Light Hop, knowing that this is a challenge, right? Relationships are challenged. We have to be so committed to really work hard at it. We have to be so committed to be keep so humble in it. We have to be so gracious and loving in the middle of it. If you're in a family, you've had this experience, you know, you really have to do it because we rub each other wrong way because we're all broken pots. But as a body at Lighthouse, what we have to do is we have to commit that we do not break relationships with people that leave. I just want to be super clear on that. We do not break relationships with people that leave. You know, it is possible to not, I mean, I, I have several wonderful friends in, in um, just over the years as you connect with different people in different ministries and different churches that I love. I don't agree with everything that they believe from a theology standpoint, but I love them. I love them. You know, as long as I don't, you know, th think they're going to cause harm to me or, you know, or my family or there's some kind of cult leader or something, then I'm, I'm okay. We're, we're good. We're going to be in a relationship with one another. So this is something we have to be careful of. We have, to, uh, we have to work at that. We never want to say, um, don't listen to that person. They're wrong. They're dangerous to you. Or anybody, or even to say anyone disagrees. I mean, for me to say, if anybody disagrees with me, it's dangerous for you to talk to. That, that's, a, that's a dangerous um, way of thinking. Okay, it's a cult-like characteristic. So, And again, this is something that every congregation is going to struggle through. But we're committed to life, have to not break relationships with people. So we know and acknowledge that God moves people around and he's fulfilling his greater purpose. Number four, they um, cults promote inappropriate loyalty or connection to the cult leader, leadership instead of Jesus. So they seek to connect their members to the cult leader and require loyalty to them instead of Jesus. Loyalty is defined as or maybe disloyalty is, designed, is defined as questioning the leader. If you question the leader in any way, you're disloyal, right? I mean, that would be opposite of what the scripture says, as far as we just talked about the noble Marines who searched out the word. Um, faithfulness is defined as supporting the leader rather than obeying Jesus. Warning, 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 bad sign, right? <laughs> Cult leaders warn their members not to touch God's anointed. Oh my goodness, right? No, no. The Bible is the final authority. I'll bring one up here. The Bible. Okay. So our first loyalty and our connection in the Bible is to Jesus. That's the right way to do it. Faithfulness is designed, divine, it is defined as loyalty to obeying the Bible, to being faithful to the commands of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13. In case you want to, I'm probably not giving you enough time. I'll give you the next one in case you want to look it up. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. But 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13 says, now I say this, that each of you, um, that each of you says, I am Paul, or I am Paulus, or I am Cephas, or I am Christ. I think I already said this. So it was Christified. It 
Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? We're, this Bible is clear. We're not talking about disproportionate loyalty to a particular leader. Now, I'm going to talk about this, though, because I think there's really two. Um, you know, sometimes we see a truth in the Bible, and we're only looking at one ditch. But there's very often one on the other side. <laughs> so... Clearly, this is a ditch. We're not just, um, we're, we're all following Jesus. Um, but God established Paul and Apollos and Cephas to be leaders of the early church. Did he not? He did. Um, first Thess so First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. So, can you see there's kind of two sides of this? This is saying, all right, this is not about saying, okay, I'm following this guy, I'm following Paul, I'm following Apollos, I'm following Cephas. We're all following Jesus Christ. But Thessalonians, is talk, he's talking about, hey, I urge you to recognize those who labor among you. Paul's saying, okay, but... We're, we're all following Christ, and I'm not asking you to become, you know, you're not a Paul follower, but at the same time, you might want to recognize those who labor among you. <laughs> that would be good, right? Um, and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Does that make sense? Um, so there's two sides. I mean, disproportionate loyalty to a leader or a group over God is not good, but Thankfulness towards the shepherds over you is not cult-like behavior either. Does that make sense? Um, you know, I was, I was talking to the Lord about this, and he brought to my mind my neighbor, um, my neighbor Valentina, who some of you have met, and um, she's, um, um, she's from Bulgaria, and she will often talk about, um, she's got a friend um, named Arnie that was an architect too, and he sponsored Valentina to be able to come to the United States. And when Valentina came here years ago, like Arnie was her, Arnie and his wife were like her lifeline. You know, she knew nothing about the United States. This was a whole new game plan for her, you know, a whole new culture, language, you know, the whole nine yards. There was a strong connection there in the beginning because she, she really needed help. But as Valentina started to grow in learning her, learning the ropes, learning the language, learning how to get a job, you know, learning um, how things operate in America, she became more and more independent of Arnie. Does that make sense? And his wife. But what's interesting to me is that in, 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 in over a course of time, her relationship with me developed. You know, it's almost like God moves us th through, you know, shepherds at different points in time as, as we need them. And I, I remember distinctly we had some kind of a birthday party for her mom, and I got to meet them, and Valentina was like, this is Arnie, this is a wife. And she was just praising them about the, what they'd done and how how... She's basically saying, I couldn't have done this without them. You know, now ultimately they're believers and God, um, you know, caused Arnie and his wife to reach out to Valentina and support them in this way. And Valentina has, you know, grown in the Lord herself. Um, but she honored them and, and really recognized what that the fruit that is in her life right now and where she's at is attributed to the, the investment that they made in her. So she's honoring them, but at the same time recognizing that they were a gift of God. Does that make sense? And even at the same time, me who was involved in her life, and she's telling them as she got done telling me about how wonderful they were. Then she goes on to tell them about how wonderful that I've been in helping her in this where she's at at this point in her walk. Um, God is so good, isn't he? I mean, he's, we're all gifts. God's using all of us. But I, it's important that for us to, to honor and, and appreciate somebody does not mean um, that, you know, we're, we're, uh, um, we're not, we don't think for ourselves anymore and that we're, that we're just a blind cult follower of that particular person. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, and if, and if somebody, and if somebody says that, I think we might just have to ask ourselves. you know, if Valentina was saying all the time, you know, Arnie, 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 at some point somebody might say, you know, Valentina, you need to start, you know, I mean, maybe it's a bad analogy, but you know, you, at some point, you need to get a little bit independent and 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 not be completely connected, independent of that person. And she's not, but but obviously that's the point for us all to to grow in our own relationship with the Lord and what the Lord is saying to us, and not rely on somebody else's revelation and study the Word, but get into it ourselves. So, 
I just wanted to make a note on that because I think if a pastor or a leader, a mentor, a parent is bearing good fruit in your life, you shouldn't have any hesitation about following them. The Thessalonians were following Jesus, um, but he gave them Paul and the other leaders to shepherd them until they matured in the faith, which is what I've been saying. So Jesus said, I'm praying for everyone who will believe in me because of you, James, John, and Peter. In other words, he's saying, I'm using you, James, John, and Peter to be my vessels. I'm praying that people are going to believe in me because of you. God uses people. He uses shepherds. He places people in our lives. I think the other thing, too, is that some people have a divine experience where Jesus appears to them and he says, um, it's me, turn towards me, you know, Paul on the road of Tarsus. But for most of us, he uses people. It's the experience and the relationship of people that draw us into a deeper relationship with the Lord. It's our connection. As we grow in Christ, what we end up doing, though, is we end up following people less and less, and we're following Christ more and more. Does this make sense? So uh, another good example that John the Baptist, he pointed his disciples towards Christ. He said they were following him for a good period of time, and he said, um, they're like, hey, Jesus over there, to, you know, baptizing people. What do you think about that, John? He's like, that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to become lesser, and he's supposed to become greater. We're, po- You know, a co-leader is not usually pushing people into and forward in the relationship with Christ. They're elevating themselves. They're making themselves more dependent, like, okay, you can't do anything without me. You can't think anything without me. You need me. You're totally dependent on me. Where somebody, the opposite of that, the Bible, you know, the the, the testimony of the, of the apostles is, I mean, Paul is trying to encourage and push Timothy forward. Timothy, don't let people look down on you because you're young. Set an example in word and deed. You can do this, right? That is the fruit of somebody that's not trying to build a kingdom for themselves, but they're trying to push other people up. You know, are they willing to, Paul's saying, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to put my platform aside here because I want to bring you up here, Timothy, because I, 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 I want to grow you in the faith, the next generation. That, that's what we're going for, right? So the Bible says the true shepherd will take care of the flock, but ultimately point people towards Jesus. They're going to seek to empower and elevate people to go up. Kind of related to that, I think, is the equipping of others to be teachers versus hoarding the spotlight. <laughs> that would be another one, right? I, I remember a conversation I had with, with I, I was feeling really, I was definitely being attacked by the enemy, but um, this was like, I don't know, this was like three or four months ago or something, and I was just like, I can't do this. I can't teach this. You know, I was like, I was having a meltdown. I, I mean, I felt like a, I was just not, um, I was being attacked, you know, I was definitely being attacked. And I was like, Can't, would you like, could you like to, wouldn't you like to teach instead of me? <laughs> you know, and he was like, of course I would. I love to teach, but I'm not going, but I don't think that's the right thing. I, I really think that you're supposed to do this, you know, and he, and he walked me through that. And so instead of just, you know, taking that opening because, um, you know, he's got a lot of things that he'd like to share but he, he was like, no, I, I want you to. I think you are the one that needs to do it. And, um, you know, that's, I, I really appreciate him doing that because he just, uh, it kind of, he kind of held my feet to the fire there a little bit. It was a little bit uncomfortable. And I was like, I, you know, <laughs> but the Lord helped me through it. And I needed to do that because that was really a, a growing thing for me, just instead of letting, le- letting you, um, the release off the gas there and for me to not push through that. Um, you know, he, he shepherded me well in that, which is really good. So um, cults usually don't equip others. Um, they hoard the spotlight themselves. A cult will control and manipulate all streams of teaching. It will imply that the leader or the group has special revelation that no one else has. No one can ever have a different opinion than the leader. No dialogue is allowed. So um, this is obviously not what the Bible talks about either. We see examples of even... Um, you know, even Paul confronting Peter, right? And he was pretty, pretty in your face about it. He was like, you are wrong because, you know, you started acting differently when the Jews came and before that you were eating with the Gentiles. So now you're caught, you even caused Barnabas to, you know, to, to fall away. And, and he's, he's confronting him and, you know, confrontation isn't always, um, it, 
it doesn't always have to be comfort. The word itself doesn't sound good. We have to be willing to disagree. Disagreeing in and working things out is normal. This is like normal life stuff. We're supposed to do that. Um, the Bible says you can disagree. It's totally fine to disagree. But I think what we have to be mindful of is, is the better we go about that, I think the better it is for relationships. Does that make sense? I mean, uh, our, our um, approach here would be if you disagree, fine. But what we want to do is we want to try to be we 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 want to be to to try to be as gracious towards each other as we can in that because it just makes the process a little bit easier. Um, nobody, it's not in the Bible to say nobody can have a different opinion or nobody can disagree. That's you know, it, that's not our model of the way that we want to be able to do things. And um, that's not saying that's easy. <laughs> that's not saying that's easy. That can be a hard thing. But we have to really work at it and be gracious towards each other in it because um, even. Even to, to bring up a different perspective can be hard um, because we love each other and we don't want to hurt each other. So, um, so someone is getting revelation and you become a follower of them, that also doesn't make you a cult follower too. Um, I think what happens is it's this whole concept I just gave about Paul and Timothy and, and Apollos. Um, they were certainly getting revelation and that revelation is what we're feeding off of today in the new Testament. So number five, they cross biblical boundaries of behavior instead of walking in purity and integrity. So cults, um, the places of compromise are often in immorality and finances. Um, they twist the scripture to invalidate that impurity and lack of financial integrity. So um, that's one area is compromise in the financial arena. The other one, Second Peter 2, describes the compromise of adultery and covetous practices. So they insist that owning or controlling the money and property of the group is they're entitled to that. They're, they're the anointed one that should be able to do that. So I think this kind of goes without saying, I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The Bible is very clear that sexual purity and owning personal property is the biblical model. Um, a, a sixth characteristic of cults would be that they separate from the church instead of promoting a culture of honor towards the church. So, it's like they're disconnected from the wider church because it's the idea that cults believe that they alone have a special status with God. Makes me think about the Jehovah Witnesses and the 144,000. Like, we're the only ones. We're the 144,000. Too bad for the rest of you. <laughs> um, that's obviously a cult teaching. They criticize the rest of the body of Christ, and they often claim to be the only ones that are truly saved. Um, they view all other ministries and denominations as being an error. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we love Jesus by loving the whole church. Um, we cultivate a culture of honor towards other churches. We pray for other churches. It's a, it's a privilege to be a house of prayer here because I love the fact that we're a church, right? We're all here in a church today, but we have a house of prayer that people from different churches and denominations can come in here and can pray with us. They can be involved in praying in agreement with us over our city. So um, our goal is to embrace all who want to agree with us in contending for our city. This is a, this is a beautiful thing. So we want to, um, we also want to highlight though that loving is not the same as agreeing with everybody else. Does that make sense? We, um, it's really a fine line and we live in a culture that really blurs these areas where if you disagree with me, then you're not loving. Does this mean that my friend that is a homosexual, that I disagree with that behavior because this is the, the Bible says that that is, uh, that that is a sin. Does that mean I don't love that person? No, we have to be able to separate. We can love and honor um, d different people, groups, churches, but we don't have to agree with them in every area and not agreeing with them doesn't make us um, a cult. It doesn't make anybody a cult. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, well, otherwise, I mean, this is, you got all these divisions and denominations with one another. Um, I mean, they might say one. One might say. I mean, I think about because we were associated with a with a wonderful Lutheran church for a while. That um, uh, ELCA is different than um, LCMS. They're they're a branch off of the of the Lutheran church, and they both have the Lutheran label. But one is very conservative in their theology, and the other is very liberal in their theology. So they can love each other, but um, they're not 
you're probably not going to find them going forward and doing big um, uh, prayer events together or, or doing big um, ministry uh, moves together because they fundamentally don't uh, agree with the what the word of God says. Does that make sense? So we have to make sure. I'm just trying to, this is a narrow road, right? I'm talking about both sides of it. So um, <clears throat> it is biblical to identify compromises that are being promoted in the church, but without criticizing specific ministries by name, unless going through the biblical process described in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, which you can look up. Um, there are times to bring judgment to ministries that have destructive doctrines and behavior, which the Bible outlines, but we need to do this in a right way and in the right spirit. Um, I was, it was interesting that, um, you know, with our subject on the sackcloth and so forth, I mean, I, I was looking up some stuff and doing some research on it, and I pull up this YouTube video, and you've got these people out there in sackcloth, and they're outside this church, and they're like, you're going to hell. You guys are you know, you know, you're Satan's ambassador. It's just terrible. It's just terrible to think that we're going to be able to effectively communicate any message to anybody in that way with the wrong heart attitude um, and hate and anger instead of love. It's, it's bad fruit. It's called, it, it's the pot calling the kettle black kind of a thing. And um, I think it's important also for us to just remember that five out of seven of the churches in Revelation were being reprimanded. So it is important for us. It, it, it often is loving to say, I, I don't know that what you're teaching here is a biblical truth. So we got to take a stand against things that Jesus took a stand at and realize that although we feel that a, um, although we feel that a denomination is an error, in some way, there are millions of faithful believers who really refuse to compromise. God is the one that judges the heart. A denomination can take a position on something that we believe is a total false teaching, but we can't assume that every believer that's in that denomination is lost. Number seven, emphasizing special revelations that contradict scripture. So cults emphasize a special revelation of their leader that contradicts scripture. So it isn't there. It's a twisting or manipulation of scripture the, in the, or, or it's twisted to, to suit their purposes. The Bible, um, we emphasize the infallibility of the Bible. It's the final authority. We emphasize the main and the plane of scripture, things like the supremacy of the, of Jesus, the two great commandments, the, the great commission, living the sermon on the Mount lifestyle, um, prayer, studying the word, winning for the lost, praying for healing um, to take place of the sick, serving, etc. cetera. So, um, and, and you know, it's, it's a good time to maybe highlight the fact that there are several things that Lighthop believes as part of our core values that um, they're not mainstream. And so because they're not mainstream, the tendency for most people would be able to say, that's different, so that's like a cult. <laughs> We're gonna, it's got to be searched out in the word. Everything has got to line up to the word. Um, the following are not indications of a cult, a, a different view of eschatology. So let's say you believe we're going to go through the tribulation. I mean, there's going to be people that are going to say, that's a false teaching. Ironically, it's the oldest teaching. It's the ones the apostles believed in. <laughs> and we're like, that's a false teaching. Okay, well, that's what the disciples taught. So I guess you're saying that's a false teaching as well. Um, you know, just to rem I mean, zeal for the Lord is offensive. We just got to remember that. I mean, sometimes that's at the core. Sometimes that's the, it's not just about the thing that well, I'm disagreeing with that thing, but sometimes that thing is an expression of wholeheartedness and zeal for the Lord. And that's where the fence comes in. Um, wholeheartedness exposes uh, others' lukewarmness. So, um, yeah. So it's important for us to discern the truth. So I want to kind of wrap up with this important um, part of the teaching and I love the fact that the Bible is really simple about how do we discern false teachings, false teachers, or, you know, therefore cults. How do we discern that? Because it can be so confusing um, right now. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of false teachings that are throughout the mainline church. We're not going to get into any of those. That's, you know, that's my opinion. Maybe that'll be another message, but we need to be able to discern the truth. So how do we do that? The Bible is super clear. And it's a super simple way to be able to, to judge that. So if you want to look with me um, at um, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Actually, you know what? Before that, go to Luke 6 first. I'm sorry. 
Luke 6, verses 43 through 45. By the way, as I'm going to talk about, because we're going to talk about the fruit, um, this is not just a cult thing. This is a examine your heart thing. This is all across the church thing. This goes beyond, okay, I'm looking to see if you're a cult by your fruit. We would just look to see if you were following Jesus. <laughs> That's what bearing fruit is about. Are you following Jesus? Are you following the Bible? Are you in a relationship with him um, wherever you are? Whatever you're following, whatever you're believing, what is your fruit? Because a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So Luke 43, 4 through 5, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, he can do nothing. What is the teaching that you're receiving, doing in your own heart? It's a good question to ask, right? So you look at a cult and say, what is the teaching producing in their heart? Don't even call it a cult. What is that place that I'm going to, that church, that thing I'm believing in, that teacher I'm listening to? What is it producing in my heart? Because the Bible says, it's clear. This is how you're, it's saying a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And good fruit does not come from a bad tree. Um, look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such. There is no law. If I don't have love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, then I know I'm being sanctified. I haven't arrived yet. I'm on a journey. This is right. This isn't a destination. It isn't the moment that I got salvation that I was like a perfect human being. So I get that. But I should be producing something. Now, any given day, I'm probably also producing some bad fruit too, right? Maybe you took a bite of it and you're like, yeah, that doesn't taste so good, you know? And then I got to come back later and repent and just say, oh, I'm sorry. I really, I got off track, right? Um, but my tree should be producing fruit. My, my tree should be tr producing good fruit. You can use this. Doesn't it make it simple? Isn't this liberating? Look around you all the, all over. And sometimes it's hard because maybe you're looking at a, a big ministry or a, a big time pastor or a speaker or evangelist or prophet or something like that. And it's a little bit harder for you to know, well, what is their fruit? Because I don't really know them that well. Just pray. Pray that the Lord would give you wisdom. What is the focus of their ministry? What are they leading? All the things we talked about with the Bible. What are, are they leading people unto holiness? Are they looking to consecrate people? Is that the fruit? Is it about Jesus or is it about all these, you know, external things? Is it about elevating them? Is it about making them look good? Is it about making them look their ministry look good? Or is it about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? This Holy Spirit will bear witness in you about what is happening there. We have to ask this now, friends. We're in a time where already there's false teachers all over, all among us. So we need to constantly keep checking our own heart, but we have to be checking the messages all around us because the devil is sinister. He is, the funny thing is, he'll t you're like, oh, well, thank God I just got out of that ditch and the d d devil's like, great, I'm going to push you in the other one. <laughs> You, you have to, we have to be our eyes right on Jesus so that we can walk that narrow path and not get off into the ditches and not be deceived. We have to bind up the spirit of confusion. We bind up the spirit of confusion right now in Jesus' name. We have to be contending as David did that I want to be like a, a you know, I want to be like a tree by streams of living water that yields its fruit in season that does not wither. Right? We got to be going after it. We got to be in this relationship. It's got to be like this because we can't be looking at the waves around us, right? The reason why Sarah got off track when she was dealing with the whole situation with with the with the baby and and then gave Hagar to her husband Abraham and then they begot Ishmael and 
Isaac came later and look at the, all of the, we're, we're having the backlash of the, the contention and the, the enmity between Ishmael and Isaac to this day in the Middle East because Sarah looked at her circumstances instead of looking at the promises of God, instead of keeping that relationship going laterally. And so um, we have to recognize that if what I'm abiding in is producing fear, strife, anger, covetedness, sensuality, pride. Maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't even culting. Maybe it's just what you're, what you're studying, teaching, the way you're looking at the person, whatever, you, what, whatever um, teacher you're following. If it's producing those things, it's not of God. It's not of God. Because the Bible says that a good tree does not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree does not bear good fruit. And that every tree is known by its fruit. So James 3.13, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show it by his good conduct that his works are done in meekness and in wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom uh, that is from uh, above is first of all pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So I just wanted to kind of end it with ask, asking yourself right now that if fruit is so important in the overall scheme of things, what ought to we, what should we be asking ourselves? What is the teaching that I'm abiding in producing in my life? What is the teaching that I'm abiding in producing in my life? If it is producing growing in holiness, growing in repentance, growing in a commitment to Jesus, are you spending more time with Jesus? Are your family relationships better? Are your family, is your family more united? Are your kids going after the Lord? Are your kids reading your Bible and praying more? Are they going out? Are they, are they going after spiritual things? I mean, I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm just talking about, um, I'm just talking about what does it look like? I mean, it, this is simple. What's your family looking like? What are you looking like on the inside? A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So ask yourself, am I bearing good fruit? Right? It's a good question to ask yourself. So um, I didn't get to this, but I would encourage you all as homework to read Matthew 23. This is really good at examining the false because he indicts the Pharisees. You know, the one like, woe to you, guys. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Right? <laughs> That's the one. It's really good. So, um, Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for truth. We thank you that your truth pushes out the darkness. <laughs> we thank you that you have given us your holy word to guide us and direct us. Lord, not only did you give us your holy word, but you gave us your spirit to discern the word. Lord, we can't do this without you. We need you. And we know that confusion abounds in that the enemy just wants to cause us to be like a wave of the sea blown and tossed to and fro. He wants us to be double-minded. He wants us to be unstable in all we do, but we declare that we will be singly focused in on you. We want to look at you in the mirror, who you are. You are a perfect mirror and not forget what we look like because you're what we're supposed to look like. Lord Jesus, would you establish us? as the reflection of you here on earth, your ambassadors, would you give us incredible discernment and wisdom and understanding? Supernatural, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives, Lord Jesus. Would you guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus? And we ask these things in your heavenly name. Amen.